Okay, so so what I what I thought we'd do today, right, was to be apprehensive about um, moving on to discuss procedures. So what I, what I thought would would be useful to people is if we maybe just um, went through the um, some some few additional examples on loops together. Maybe we can we can do some hands-on here, which is why I was asking if if the machines you're sitting on are working. So if they're working, then maybe we can just work through maybe one or two examples. Um, make sure that we're on the same page before we move to procedures. Is this working? How many are sitting behind a machine that's working? One. The machines are not working there. <sighs> okay, those of us sitting on a machine that's working, I mean, maybe we can play along. But those of us that are not sitting behind the machine, I thought I had a few other examples. Did we go through the count even numbers? Does this make sense? Sorry? I'm sorry? Did you go through the count even? What do you do when you go back home? Right? Relax and chill out. Netflix and chill. Sorry? OK. Um, yeah, things are going to pile up, right? Um, it turns out that the other part that's coming after this is not, it's, it's a bit more abstract. And I mean, there's no hands on there. So a bit of imagination here, which is why I want to make sure we understand. Um, Okay, can I say then we, we can either do this, we can walk through these two examples maybe. I had a whole bunch of examples, right? So I had a, there was this count even, which is already on YouTube actually, and then there's a, a question that just checks to see if um, a number that a person enters is a prime number, for instance. Um, and then there's a, a question that, um, that requires you to write a program that um, request or prompts a user to enter um, an unlimited list of numbers, right? So I could enter, for instance, five, two, three, and six. Um, and then once I'm done, I must return the sum of those numbers. So another user might enter 100, 200, and 300. And then um, the program must return the sum of the numbers that the user has entered, right? So the question is, how do we use loops to do that? Um, and then I thought I would, I would include this really fun, <coughs> excuse me, this fun example. It comes up a lot when it comes to uh, programming. It's called the FizzBuzz example. It probably, if you just Google up FizzBuzz, you'll have a whole bunch of things that come up. So the idea behind this is, um, with respect to the programming language, you'd be required to write a program that uh, takes in a range of numbers, for instance, one to 100. And the, your goal or your task would be to say, um, um, you, if a number um, is divisible by three, you print fees, um, right? If the number is divisible by five, you print bars. Um, if a number is divisible by both three and five, you print fees bars. And, and then if a number is not divisible by any of those two numbers, you just print the number, right? So you notice that one is not divisible by three or five, two is not, Three is divisible by three, so we're printing fees here. Four not. Five is divisible by, um, by five, so it's bars, right? Uh, yeah, six here uh, is fees because it's divisible by three, right? And then you notice that once we get to 14, we print fees bars. I mean, and really, if you think about this, there's a combination of different things that we've spoken about, right? So the idea is how do we use those uh, bare instructions to come up with a program like this? This is branching here, right? The, you, you use the div function to you divide div um, input by three. If, if the, the, the number in the high register is equal to zero, then you know that the number is divisible by three, and so you return fees. Div five, if that number is divisible by, by uh, div the number comma five, right? If the number is divisible by five, you're gonna return bars. Do you see this? Right. Um,
Okay, let's walk through the two examples. We'll walk through maybe one or two or something, and then we'll part ways. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that there's a, a class that we missed um, when we, we, we cut our session short the other day, so we need to come up with a day when we have a makeup. I was hoping we could do this this week, but I think I'm going to propose that we have our makeup on the 29th of September. So it will be a Sunday to catch up on that class. All right, so I already have called for the count even, um, uh, the count even numbers, right? Uh, but before you look at the code, you notice here that if you think about it, right, the question is saying we count, we count the number of even numbers that are between zero and 10. If you were to form a mental picture, you know that the even numbers between zero and 10, including 10 is zero, two, four, six, eight. So how many are there? I mean, we could have just as well have said, count the number of even numbers between zero and 100, for instance, right? Doesn't matter. So immediately realize here that um, for you to, to come up with a solution, um, you go through this series of steps and it's pretty easy, right? The initial values that you identify already is uh, zero and 10, right? Zero and 10. Initial values, zero, right? Why zero? Because zero is the first even number that we're going to process. 10, why 10? 10 because 10 is the last even number that we want to process in our range, right? And in fact, not only that, we're going to use 10 as, as a value to, to check whether or not we should branch out of our loop, right? Usually, I mean, for the problems we've been looking at, it's just BGT we've been working with. But it could be that you might actually um, end up working with a different instruction or operation, right? Maybe BOT. If the question was like, uh, 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 if the question required you to work with negative numbers, for instance, you notice that you'd probably have to work with BOT. Right? If the range was negative, let's say negative 10 to zero, for instance. It's like you're going in the opposite direction now. Okay, and then something else you realize here is that um, we also need to keep track of, we need a variable to keep track of the, the count, because you have to ask yourself, how are we going to be counting the number of even uh, numbers in the range? So the idea is you, you, if you think about it, you process, you process the numbers one by one. Once you get into that loop, you check if zero uh, is, you first of all check if zero is greater than 10, which it's not. Um, and then the processing requires that you first of all divide zero by two, because you know that an even number, you know, even numbers are, are divisible by two, right? Without leaving any remainder, the remainder must be zero. Um, so what you, what you must do is you divide the, the number you're processing by two, um, and then check if the remainder is equal to zero. If the remainder is equal to zero, then you know that it's an even number, right? So you need, um, uh, we'll call this variable x1 to uh, keep track of count. And then you probably need another variable that's going to keep track of remainder. Is it making sense? And then for the conditions, you know that the condition is simple. You branch out of loop if value is greater than 10. Right? In fact, what we're saying is just BGT here. BGT, whatever value, assuming the values are going to be here, then uh, you're going to go to some, to some label, let's say triple X, Y, Y, Y or something. This is making sense. Uh, so when you're working with problems to do with loops, 
the, the initial value is really important. Impl yes. Okay, we're just working, working through the process and then I'll walk, walk through the example. Uh, which part are you not clear with? Sorry? Yes. What? It's the name, <laughs> yeah, not the data. So you, you know why the steps are important? Do you know why the steps are important? For you to systematically come up with a solution, you just don't start writing things down. You, you need to form a mental picture of the steps that you need to follow for you to process the question. And I do hope this is what you did for the reboot, right? Probably not. It, it turns out that it makes life a lot easier that way. So this is like we're coming up with pseudo code, the things that we'd have to do. In fact, I'll just say, I'll remove this if it's confusing, right? We'll see if it makes sense once we go to the code here. Implementation of the loop body of us is, is gonna be trivial once you, you know the initial values and uh, the branch conditions to use, right? Modification of the values. You know that the modification of the values will involve you um, altering what? You must alter the, the numbers that you're processing somehow, right? So, um, uh, and because our implementation is, check, is checking, we're working with natural numbers and our implementation is checking each of the natural numbers one by one, you know that um, you must increment, increment uh, numbers by one. Yeah. In fact, this is it, it, this is this is probably the only thing that we are modifying, right? We're in, increment because the reason we want to modify the values is we want to get to a stage where we are processing the next number in the range. So we process zero, we want to process one, we want to process two, we want to process three. So we have to increment this value by one so that we get to the next number. Right? Modification of initial values. Uh, well, it's. Well, it's just altering, altering, altering some of the values that you've initialized in step one so that you eventually get to a stage where you terminate or you get out of the loop, number one, and also so that you process the next item in the range or in the list. Well, so we, we, are, we, we are saying we are not, uh, we, we are trying to use a different approach for even numbers. The formal definition of an even number is a, a number that is divisible by two, right? So what we'd be doing in our range is, if we're working with natural numbers from zero, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, for each of these numbers we're saying, we check to see if it's an even number. How do we check if, how do we check if one is an even number? We divide one by two. What is the remainder if we divide one by two? The remainder is one. When we check the remainder, because the remainder is not zero, then we know that it's not an even number. We get to two, we divide two by two, the remainder is zero, right? And because the remainder is zero, we know it's an even number. And so we, we, we count it as an even number. So we just add one to the variable that's... Well, because we need to process the next number in the range. We'll get to the example, maybe I'll walk you through the example. I have an example here. And then repeating the body here is, uh, uh, is, is, is as simple as, um, as just saying, you know, we branch unconditionally to whatever label you have here. And someone uh, did ask the other time, I think it was Kevin, I don't know if it was Kevin or somebody else, I don't know if it was uh, Blessed or something else, asking to say, can we not use J instead of branch? You can if you want to. You end up with the same result, right? In all these different cases, you're telling the CPU to say you want to go to the address represented by this label, right? Um, so in terms of the complete code here, just to walk through the, see how you map on this uh, pseudo code here to what we just did, you notice that it's, it's not that hard. Um, not that hard at all. Right, so in terms of the steps, you notice that line number, um, 
from line number 13 to 16, um, I'm defining the initial values that you're going to be working with, right? Um, and I think our description didn't include the two here because you need to keep track of the number that you're going to use as a divisor, right? Uh, so we are saying here that line number 13, the register eight is going to hold, it's the one that's going to keep track of the numbers that we are processing. So when you are processing zero, we're going to put zero into register eight. The next time we're processing one, we're going to put one into register eight. The next time we're processing two, we put it into eight, which is why eight is holding the initial value zero, right? Representing the uh, numbers that we're processing. And then register nine is going to hold the maximum number that we're going to use as a condition, the last even number that we wish to process. And we need this for the condition, right? Um, and then in line number 15, we're saying that register 10 is going to hold it's going to hold our count. Because we want to count these things, we need to, counting is a lot easier if you start from zero, just like summation, you start from zero, right? Um, so if we want to start counting the even numbers, we know that we will we'll initially have to start with the zero. Once we start processing the numbers, we check is the zero, does zero result in a remainder of zero in divided by two? If it does, then we shall add one to the register 10. So it's zero plus one. Once we process one, one divided by two results in a remainder of one. So we cannot count that as an even number. We don't add one to the register 10. But once we process two, two by two returns a remainder of zero, and then we add one to the register 10 here, right? Um, and then 16 is basically just holding the number two because there's no easier way of dividing, uh, dividing the, even, the, the even numbers, the, the numbers we're going to be processing by two. We're saying we're going to keep track of the two here into register 11, right? Initial values. And then implementation of the loop here starts from line number 18 all the way up to, um, uh, it's supposed to be line number 24. There's a bit of a mistake here. B loop label. So we are starting from line number 18 all the way up to line number 24. But observe what's happening here in the implementation. I said that the first thing that you typically do is you check if the condition is satisfied. Because we do know that uh, the loop works in this way. When you check the condition, if it is satisfied, if it's true or if it's yes, it results in a yes, then you process the instructions under the loop body. If it's not satisfied, if it's a false or if it's a no, then you ignore the loop body and just start processing the instructions that follow after the loop body. And typically you will have instructions when you're working with, um, I guess, complex code, you will have instructions immediately after the loop body, right? Right, so we check the condition first here, saying, check if the value that's in register eight at which point it's zero is greater than the value that's in register nine. Register nine has 10. So we know that uh, zero is not greater than 10, so we can't branch to print even. What do we do? We go to line number 20. In line number 20, we are saying we are going to divide the number that is in register eight by what is in 11. What is 11 will always be two, because we're trying to divide the numbers by two, uh, by following our heuristic or our step, right? Yeah, so we divide uh, what's in eight uh, by two, and then we we, we, we keep track of the remainder. We said that when you're working with a DIV function, or operator, or operation, the, 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 result, the result of dividing a number by, by divisor is going to be in the low register. The remainder is going to be in the high register. Right? The actual answer is in the low, the remainder is in the high register, which is why in line number 20 we are saying that we want to move from the high register, the value that's in high register, move it to register 12. So essentially we're saying, move the remainder of dividing what's in eight by two into 12. Yeah. Um, once you move it into 12, uh, in line number 22 we are saying, we will check if what is in 12 is equal to zero, because essentially what we're saying is we want to count a number as an even number if, if it has a remainder of zero. And how do we check if it has a remainder of zero? In this case, we're saying we will use BEQ, 
branch if equal. So branch if the remainder is equal to zero, which is why we're using special purpose register zero here. <clears throat> we, we branch to count even in this case, right? So we're saying if, uh, if this is zero, then go to count even. Notice at this stage, flow, pro program flow will be transferred to where there's count even. Count even is in 26, so we'll ignore this stuff here. We'll move to 26. Once we get to 26, we start processing what's under 26 because the label is nothing more than like a series of code that you have to execute, right? So we go to line number 27. We add one to whatever is in register 10. Why? Because we've defined as an initial value register 10 to hold the counts. So because zero is an even number, it returns the remainder of zero and divided by two, we count it as an even number by adding one to what is in 10. After we add one to what is in 10, we say we want to move and start processing the next number in the range, which is obviously going to be one. So for us to move from zero to one, we just add one to what's in eight, right? So eight is zero here, we add one, it will be a one. We are modifying, in this case in line number 28, we are modifying the initial value so that we process the next number in the range so that we eventually get out of the loop if you don't do this, you will never get out of the loop, right? And your machine will probably crash or run out of resources. And then, in line number 29, we are saying once we modify the value, we loop, repeat. So we're branching to loop body, uh, loop label here. So once we just say B loop label, we will move from line number 29, we'll move to line number 18. And then you notice that in line number 18, we start doing what we did before, over and over again, right? Like Sisyphus here, right? So because eight is one, we're going to say branch if one is greater than 10, because nine is 10. It is not. We come here, because eight has one, we're saying one divided by two. We, we move whatever remainder returns from dividing one by two. We know the remainder is going to be one, right? So we'll move the value that is in 12. I mean, so the value that is in the high register, which is the remainder to the register 12, which is a one. We come here in line number 22, branch if one is equal to zero. One is not equal to zero, so we shall not branch here. We can't go to count even. What do we do? We process line number 23, right? Line number 23, we do what we did in line number 28. We're just modifying the value. Because one is not an even number, we don't wish to count it. We mustn't count it. What do we do? We just say, uh, if, if, it's, if it's not an even number, just Modify the initial value so that you move to the next number in line and process that and check that if, if check it if it's an even number, which is why we are adding one here to, um, to what's in eight. So uh, because eight has one, one plus one is two, and then we repeat. And then you notice here that we, we now we now have a value of uh, two in eight. We say uh, is two greater than ten? No, it's not. So we divide two by two. Two by two is just a uh, What's two by two? It's one in remainder zero, right? At, at this point, right, when you say div uh, eight comma eleven, it's like div two comma comma two. When you execute this, when the CPU ex executes this um, instruction here, what will happen is the low register will have one, the high register will have zero, because the low register has the result, the high register has the remainder. We move what is in the high register, which is the remainder to, uh, we move that value to the register 12. So essentially we're saying move, um, move zero to 12. And then we come here. Branch if equal, if zero is equal to zero, branch to count. So because uh, we're branching to count, we add one to whatever is in 10. At this point, what is in 10 is a one, so we add one to this two. So you notice that once you're done processing two, you'd have counted zero and two as even numbers and you'd not count one as an even number. So you have a count of two. You do this over and over again and you notice that you're working with three, it's like you're working with one, right? It's the same thing. You're working with four, it's like you're working with two. So you're, you're doing two, two, two different things as you're executing this loop here. Program flow is transferred to count even when it's an even number. Program control is not transferred anywhere if it's an odd number. Do you understand this? And so when you execute this, uh, 
Yes, sir. Uh, on after line twenty-four, there is no need for us to call the system then. To call? The system. The system. Yeah, after line twenty-four. <coughs> what do you mean, call the system? Uh, no. <laughs> this is so blessed came through yesterday, right? And he's like, why is this printing you are uh, something? I don't know. And I was telling him, it took a while. Usually, if you're not part of the writing process of the code, it, it, it's, it's a pain to debug, right? And it turns out that he was calling, um, he was issuing a Cisco instruction every after like a, a branch or something. You only, I said, the Cis, you only issue a Cisco when you're requesting a service from the operating system. What services? Read an integer, print an integer, read a string, print a string, read a double, print a double, right? Those are the services that you, you, by convention, you only use a Cisco if you are requesting a service from the kernel. We're not requesting a service anywhere here. So if we're printing the number somewhere, we would do that. If we're exiting, we would do that. So there's no, no reason to do that. The first part and the second part of those two instructions, they are one. The first part and? Yeah, from, from 18 to 24 yeah. and 26 to 29. Yes. Is it, does it mean that they are one? Because last week you said you're supposed to end the program so that you can see the next. I don't know. Oh, no, no, yeah, these are one. No, no, I said uh, you typically do this in the, yeah, I know what you're talking about here. It's, um, <laughs> I, see, I see what you mean here. It, it, so in this case, right, it's um, because of the implementation, we know that there will never be a time when we get out, we will never get out of this loop. The only time we get out of, the, the only time we'll be able to process what comes after a loop label here is what? Is if? Are we, is there, is there a condition, if you think about it, if you look at line number 18 to 24, is there a scenario where we would process if there was something in line number 25? Well, if we had this. Um, is there any, can you think of any scenario, if you think about this, can you think of any scenario where line number 26 would be executed here? Never. Think about this for a second. Because when you, you see program flow, right? Program flow is always from top to bottom. Like right? instructions are executed one after the other from top to bottom. So we start from line number 13, right, main. We execute this, we execute this, we execute this, we execute this, we don't execute this because it's a blank. We come here, it's a label, we start executing things that are in the label. The moment we execute this, it's like a condition, we're checking if uh, this is greater than this. If it's not, if, if this condition returns false, we process here. If, if, if it's true, then we're going to move to print even. Not, this will never be executed. You can't, there's never a time when this will ever be executed. So there's no reason to have, uh, to gracefully exit the program. But really, I mean, there's no harm in including it there. It's just that you're just increasing overhead, right? Because there's really no point in doing that. Do you guys understand this? Yes, okay. All right, so, so you notice that, uh, you know, so the, if the count makes sense, right? If the count in branching to the count makes sense, you know, where you're counting even numbers, um, you notice that uh, when, we, when we get to a stage where eight is 11, for instance, right? We're just fast forwarding to 11. We've processed zero up to 10 and then we get to 11. We will come here, once we increment 10 by one, it's 11, we'll look back here. We'll check, is 11 greater than 10? It is. And then we shall, program flow will be transferred to where print even label is. So we'll jump to line number 31, right? And you notice that what's in line number 31 is nothing more than us saying, oh, okay, line number 31 is uh, where, what you asked. We wish to print the sum. Because the sum is an integer, we must, uh, make use of system call code one to print the integer, which is why we're saying we're loading the value one into V0. Um, 
And then, because this count, not this, I'm sorry, the count is being held in register 10, we move the value of the count when we branch out of this loop to A0. And then we issue uh, the syscall here, and then we'll be able to print the, the count. Once we print the count, again, program flow goes from top to bottom. So we're in here, right? We print, we execute 32 to 34, we print um, the count, and then this line number 35 won't be executed because it's a blank. We come to line number 36. CPU is like, oh, this guy wants to branch to this label, right? So we will transfer program flow to 38 from here. We go to 38. And then in 38, uh, CPU says, oh, this guy wants to uh, load 10 into V0, and then issue his call, he wants to exit gracefully, and then we exit the program. And that's, that's it, right? And so you run this, and you'll be able to, to kind of like uh, print the sum of, uh, of the count, sorry, of uh, just to test drive it, I guess. You'll be able to uh, count. You'll be able to print the six that you want there, right? And really, if you wanted, you could, uh, I mean, just check for good measure, maybe just check to see if this works. You could just say, I want to count a number, uh, I want to count the number of even numbers from zero to 20, including 20. So just change that. Um, and then I come here and check what the answer is gonna be, and hope this is correct, and it's, it's 11 numbers, right? Um, it's not that hard. But here's, here's a, a slight twist to this thing, right? If this is clear, here's, Here's a slight twist here. What if, is this clear, yes? What I've, what I've just regurgitated right now is already on YouTube, it's there. I took the time, I created a screencast, exactly what I was saying here, walking you through the code if you wish to. Um, <clears throat> so here's another way of looking at this. What if we are processing a prime number, for instance? What if we, we ask a user to enter a number, you enter 15? and we want to check whether 15 is a prime number. How do we implement that using loops? And, and we're using very uh, elementary examples here from primary school because we know the definition of the prime number. Prime number is a number that is divisible by one and itself. So, so you already know what you have to do. Just check for numbers that are divisible by one and itself. Then they are prime numbers. Question is, how do we do that, right? How would we do that? What would be our initial values? How would we implement that? There's no solution for this, sadly. It was supposed to be an exercise. How do we do that? If we are to follow through our steps. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. The question says, uh, interesting question here. The question says, prompt. So the range would be dictated by the user. The user could say, I want to, uh, um, it's, it's actually not a range, it's a number, it's, a, it's a number, any number you use. The user can enter 120, I want to check if 120 is a prime number, is it a prime number? Don't know. Turns out that, uh, uh, by the way, just in case people are wondering here, uh, is, is it is prime? I wanted to check if we could check if we quickly in the high level programming language. The high level programming language has functions for these things. Is prime, and then you feed it two. It will tell you yes or no or something, right? But so a user enters 15 or 100. How do we check if it's a prime number? Think about this for a second. Maybe 100 is, is, uh, is a bit too further off here, but a user enters five. Is five a prime number? How would we check if five is the prime number? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, how would we check if 10 was a prime number? Then? How would we check if this number is divisible by one, by only one and itself? Yes. Maybe if the remainder is not the 
Okay, so, so here's the thing. I'm just, uh, uh, forget about MIPS, right? I'm just asking, we have 10. How do we check if 10 is a prime number? Someone is thinking, and, and that's exactly what I wanted to talk about here. So if you, if you, if you pay particular attention to what, what you say, you look at 10, you better think about the things that are before 10, and 10 itself. So what you'd have to do here is, for, for this thing to work, what you'd have to do is, if the user is interested in 10, you will start from one, all the way up to the number that the user specified, in this case 10 and you start checking these numbers one by one, you divide 10 by one, right? Because we know that uh, a, 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 num a prime number can be divisible by one is fine, if it's zero, it's fine, right? But you check, if 10, if 10 divided by two returns a remainder of zero, then you know immediately that 10 will never be a prime number. Is this making sense? So essentially, what I'm trying to say is you have to leverage loops if someone entered not 10 but 1,000, what you would have to do is you systematically check all the 1,000 numbers. You start dividing the 1,000 by the first number, which is one, by two, by three. But usually, you, you know that um, such a, a brute force kind of approach would, would make sense if you just say, the moment I come across a number that is not the number the user has specified that goes into the number, then I'll just converge, right? Do you understand what I mean? If you are if you if you are working with 1,000 and you start by by processing one 1,000 by one, remainder is zero, right? Prime number can be divisible by one, right? 1,000 by two, remainder is zero. If if you get to a stage where you two can go into 1,000, why do you have to continue checking when you know that it's already not a prime number? That's what I'm saying. Do you understand what I mean? So like if it was uh, maybe, like if it was uh, maybe uh, six, right? For six, for six, instead of you, I mean six is a small number, instead of you checking one, two, three, four, five, six times, dividing systematically six times, what you can do is you start six by one, remainder is zero, it's fine because, you know, a prime number can't be deserved by one, but six by two, remainder is zero as well. Why do you have to continue checking? No need to. Yes. Okay. Um, is this making sense? I mean, can, can you guys do this? Uh, can you do this uh, as homework at home or something? Yes. You never do this. You're supposed to do the count as homework. Nobody said they did it, right? I don't know. Um, here's another way of, sorry? No. You want the solution? <laughs> If you want the solutions, I can put them there. It's not a problem. <laughs> oh yeah, watching is good. Uh, th there's only three people that watch, right? This is fine. If you're studying from us, it's fine. <laughs> Maybe one of the three. But here's another way of looking at this. Another problem that you probably want to think about, please go through these two examples, right? It's for your own good. Um, right? If, if you wanted to, to sum up numbers that are entered by the user, right? An unspecified number of uh, integers entered by the user. So this user can enter maybe just three numbers, this user can enter 10 numbers, that user can enter 20 numbers. How do you take advantage of loops for you to add the numbers that the user has entered? What would you do? Sorry? Can you think about this? You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying is a uh, user starts your program and then there's a prompt that comes up. Enter an integer, enter integer. User enters an integer. Enter integer, user enters an integer. You notice that he's in a loop, right? Enter an integer, enters, enter an integer, enters, enter an integer, right? Until the user is satisfied, say I don't want to enter an integer anymore and then you return the sum of the numbers. How would you do that, right? That's a question. It turns out that you can take advantage of the loop. You're already in a loop, but you need to think about how you're going to get out of that loop. How, right? There are cheap tricks you can use. I mean, 
and, and I'm guessing you probably downloaded applications uh, elsewhere where you say uh, enter number or zero to exit or something, or negative one to exit, you understand? So like you're telling a user to say, when you run this program, it will, be, it will have something like, um, it will be like this, uh, enter number to add or negative one to exit, right? And then there'll be like a prompt, like so. So, so that the user knows to say, if I want to, to, to signal to the program to say, I am done specifying the numbers I want to add, I will just type negative one. And then once I type negative one, I shall exit out of the loop. So there's two conditions that you need to have there. A condition that is going to enable uh, the user specify to the system that he's done specifying the numbers, and a condition that will be looping through continuously. So this will, this will help you break out of the loop. This could be a one, could be a zero, uh, it's called a cent now, it could be anything, right? It's, it's, it's a, it could be anything that doesn't fall within the range that you're processing. It could be a character, maybe E. Right. Okay, guys, um, I'll see you when you see me. I don't know how long it's going to take to mark this, but uh, we already saw those things here. We shall compare 100% and this. Yes. Yes. Sorry? In pencil. Pencil is fine. I think you're allowed to write. I don't think, uh, I don't think you're not allowed to. Hi, Andrew. I don't think you're not allowed to. It's fine. <laughs> Unless if by the time we are marking, then <laughs> it have faded or something. I don't think so. Is that HB or something? Do they still use HB? Okay. So how does one branch off, for example, if you're prompting a user to enter an integer, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to use integers, you want to use a character. Now how do you give a conditional branch in a character? Negative one would be simple to say F. Maybe yeah, so in, so in that like case, that. I mean, if you want to use a string or something, you'd have to use the address, I guess. Not the actual character. A character was a bad example, but uh, probably a number would, would be the best thing to do, to use, yeah. Then my quiz as well. Yes. I started from the back. Right? That's fine. So I'll, I'll yeah, read I all of them. The front, right? I'll, I'll, I'll probably make sense out of that, so. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my, I have a problem with my QT screen. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's giving me all types of errors. Okay. Yeah, but on the, when I changed on the, I had Windows, Windows 10. Yeah. Like it was running perfectly. Then I uninstalled it, then I again installed Windows 10 again. But yeah. I tried to install QT screen running code. What, really what errors are coming? Uh, it's bringing uh, address at what, 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 the error, all type of errors. If you it's a simple code. So I haven't been writing code for two You want to do this? Hi, Miss Shower. Still putting on those shoes, right? Did you? And your skinny jeans. <laughs> all right, yeah. Did, did, you, I? did you upload this? Loop thing thing. The loop thing thing is um, <laughs> sometimes in life we have to do things because we have to, even if it's painful, right? Sometimes we do them because we enjoy them. Clearly, when you're saying the loop thing thing, you're not enjoying this, no, but we have to do I, them. I don't really understand the uh, yeah. loop thing. Okay. okay so I'll ask him, did you upload the, the notes or? No, this is what you are doing first. Did you upload it? On, no, on the notes? Yeah. On YouTube? Yeah. You want me to show you? Liar, liar. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm not saying you lie. Um, everything is there, right? I've gone, we've gone out of our way here to, to make everything available. You know, so, so it's there. You will find it there. I wanted to show you, but I guess the internet is, is acting up here. Um, but you will find it there, Michelle. Okay. Is, is this Michelle with a W or with a B? With a B, right? And it's with a W. Oh, it's gone. And it's gone. Okay. So, uh, how do you allocate space to the, uh, like the, the the previous example you gave us in the slides? Okay. Uh, where we are supposed to print out our, our name as Hello John. Now, how do you allocate space? Is it showing that we have to allocate space to? In the data section. Now, how do you do it? We tried. Well, so you use, what do you mean you tried? You didn't try. Brighton, what you want to do is you, you want to, let me start with this question. Go to settings. Did you go to settings and go to MIPS and, and check this? The load exception handler and check it. 
everything should be unchecked except for the accept pseudo instruction part. Yeah, and on the file here, there's like a no world or something. Yeah, I just ignore this. What you want to do is start by saying, use default exception handler, right? Like so. Just say uh, default exception handler and then untick this and then just say okay. And then it should be able to work without a problem. Is that fine? Yeah, I think so. Mm. But is mass also on the DC hub? Yeah, everything is on the DC hub. Yeah, I think I'll use mass. I don't need this. Well, you know what needs? <laughs> I don't have use for this. <laughs> you can pass them over to the other people. In the See, people don't want them because the reboot, they were not expecting the reboot. It came, right? Yeah. The reboot, it came. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what you're saying is... Uh, uh, Emma, we are locating space here. Sir. So you want to, to let's say print what? Let's say we'll print uh, 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 we'll, we'll just print uh, hello and then followed by your name, right? Um, what we said is we're supposed to uh, allocate space. And I'll just say, uh, I guess, 100 or something. Um, <clears throat> and then we said uh, we have to. This is cool. I mean, for good measure, we'll just uh, kind of like exit here as well. Just, just try and see if it works first. We're not done yet. Um, just to see if it works, and then, and then we are saying, uh, yeah, what system call? Eight. 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 Um, system it was one. It was one. We're putting L. We're putting L. Ah. Sorry, you're putting what? We're putting L, not one. You should go in the notes. What do you mean L? Who said it was? Is there a register called AL? <laughs> That's the register. <laughs> no, but they're, they're here. What do you mean? The things we're using are in here. We thought it was L, not one. No, the thing, it's here. Here. In fact, you can just use register 5 if you don't want to use A, but it's, okay. it's here. These are the things we're working with. Um, Oh, so you can use any special register? No, by convention it must be this. You remember this? Uh, oh my goodness. Is, there, is it here? Or somewhere? Oh, pointing on the AL, right? Yeah. Um, probably not. It's like what? It's 21, I think. Looks like there's no class today in here, right? You can might as well stay in here until. So you want to, and in fact, the answers are in here. You could have checked there, right? Uh, so we're saying when you are reading a string, see this, right? So the number of characters, right? then we will um, print the string now, is it? Yeah. But we're printing the string that's on uh, plan name. I mean, hopefully if we've done the right things here, we should be able to um, run it without a problem. Is it under immediate? Sorry. Uh,
can you do this? No, it's not. There's something we're not doing right. Or maybe we're supposed to have a name on your pictures. When, when we say hello, then automatically you switch to that name. No, you have to, you have to enter your name in the first. Hello, when you enter your name. Uh -huh. Then it brings hello, hello your name again. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but like you said, what you want to do is you want to, first of all, for this to make some sense, you want to do this. Right. Do you understand this? You prompt, you prompt the name first before you, you kind of like uh, print the thing, right? So, so that there will be like another what's your name and then, um, uh, Hi, how are you? And then, like so. How would you say it's AL though? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like, you just didn't see it. You want to get into the habit of, uh, instead of spending hours and hours, you, you, you want to, you want to, um, why are we loading? You want to look up the errors that come up. Sorry? You want what? This? Yes. <laughs> what? Well, people haven't been, have not been uploading these things, right? Salah. To. Why do we have to load this? I can, I can also do this phrase for you, if you wish. No, it's fine. You can capture it. Sorry, how do you? Like, why are we not doing 100 in that? So 100 is like the space or what? Yeah, it's the space. Okay, but so yeah. why are we not it's, doing it? It's there. Do you want to open up the thing he has? Um, what is 100? If you go to system call, call it number 8. Number 8. Then. The, the key thing here is um, the, this value here, the number of characters. This is supposed to be number of characters associated with what's going to be entered. This is the space you're reserving in memory, right, in RAM, in this case. And then these are the characters corresponding to the character. What you just want to make sure is that this value must never be greater than this value. It must be less or equal to. Yes? If it's more, then you are reserving this space so that it is used to hold what is going to be typed by the user. So what the user is going to type must not exceed 100 bytes. And we know that if this is a name, 100 bytes, like a character is a byte, right? So you need to take into account, like if it's, if it's a name of a person and this person has three names, you take into account the spaces and all oh, the potential length of Wamunim or something, long name, right? There are some people with long names and do you understand this? Yeah. Which is why I just, like I used a hundred, it could be 50 actually. Maybe hundred was pushing it too far. I don't think there's anyone with a, a name that has more. Oh. So now, what happens behind the scene because uh, the register only holds 32 bits, is it not? Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so what happens is, for example, if the user enters uh, uh, the name that is more than the two bits because it's about 800. Yep. That means that if you also use. No, but we, which is why we are. Where are we here? We are, where, where is this? We are located. This is RAM. We're in RAM, which is, which is why, if oh, you've noticed, the, whenever we're working with strings, we're defining this thing in the data section, which is like RAM. So in RAM, this thing is stored, and if you remember how QTSPM works here, uh, this data section. Um, 
if you guys remember how this thing works, um, and I guess you probably is a stack or something. Right, the hello here. You notice that the way it's because we said memory is a uh, word aligned or byte addressable. Each of these different things are like, you know, one byte, one byte. So it's I mean you don't have to worry about that because you're working in main memory. You're no longer dealing with registers at that point. But um, okay. But, but again, it's more like a contribution. So. Yeah. I think that would be possible because each collector will be entered as an individual, be executed as. Where? Uh, like, for example, say to have a bit, it's more than 30, it takes two bits if you were to, to segment it into yeah. binary. So, I mean, the way the. the 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 one minimum thing is going yeah. to be executed is in such a way that first you have to load the first uh the first m whatever execution then yeah but but uh, his question was uh or how how is this handled by registers the thing is you don't work with strings and, and you have a point there but with the, the other interesting thing to raise is you don't work with with you you don't load these strings into registers no you're specifying memory addresses where they're located in, in RAM, right? The address, so it's a pointer, it's just a pointer. It's a pointer. And some people that have kind of like made mistakes of trying to print values of registers they've loaded into registers, you notice that you print some weird number, which is the register in memory, right? Oh, that's Yeah. Is this fine? So if you haven't delegated this place, that's why it says out of bounds. Yeah, because where are you going to hold it? Where is it going to go, right? It has to go somewhere, is it? Sorry? You have a class? Victor, in here. Where, who is he? Who is coming? Oh, okay. Yeah, they have a class. Okay. Do you understand this? <laughs> what are you trying to do? You want to save it, control S if you want to. Why would you want to locate one byte? I want to say what? Uh, yeah, and QTS. You probably want to use the mouse. It's configured if the touch pad is configured differently. Yeah, that's the same one. won't allow you to. It won't. It's not enough, right? I mean, um, the space we've allocated is not sufficient. I mean, maybe two, try two bytes and then see if it will allow you to... Yeah, still. What did I do? I, I made a mistake here. Two is fine, uh, but what I needed to do is not just to reset, but just pull it out here and then try it. Two is much better, but you notice that uh, as I'm typing, it automatically forces me to, it goes to the next instruction once I, I, I yeah, once I exceed the, the, the limit I've specified, which is why I only have one T there. So. Okay, are there any other questions? Things that you're not, that are not making sense? What we've done so far, is this making sense? Can you go and do the prime numbers thing? In this case, there's no mass. There's no what? Mass. No flash. No. Why do you want to use the flash? Don't, why? It's, it's on the hub. I mean, it's, no, it's on the hub. Everything is on the hub. Uh, why do you want to do that? 
Don't uh, But sometimes it says you have to, when you download Mars, you have to download is it the Java the Java what? Yeah, because it's uh, so the way Mars works is it's um it's implemented using the Java programming language and so you need the uh, the Java runtime environment for you to be able to uh, run Java programs. But Windows 10 has the environment. Sorry? Windows 10 already has the environment. I'm not sure about Windows. Typically most most because Java has become so popular, so most, most operating systems, most modern day operating systems will have uh, the JRE already available to you. Um, Yeah. yeah, that's the thing, right? That's what you, yeah, we know, right? <laughs> this is what you, yeah, this is uh, what you, happens, uh, yeah, because people are cheating, right? We were just fast, writing yeah. code, fast, fast. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Why do you know Do you know the beauty of uh, an application like uh, this man's thing? Yeah. Because of the way it's, uh, it's Java Archive file, it's Java. You don't, you see for these other applications like QtSpin, the QtSpin I have here can only be used on Ubuntu. If you want to go and run it on Windows, you need to download the Windows version, <laughs> right? But the beauty with this is because of how Java works, uh, you might want to read up on how it works actually. There's a virtual environment that's created for you, which is where you need the JRE, right? And it was writing code there. So you can run, you can, yeah, well, it has an editor, but we're trying to avoid uh, this the thing you are raising. Oh, you need uh, the runtime environment for that thing, right? Um, and also the idea was to, to actually kind of like um, showcase to people that in fact, you, 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 get, to use diff you get to use different tools for you to, to write um, code in assembler, right? So you have a text editor like Notepad or Notepad++, and then you need the actual simulator, which is uh, spin. Um, so there's a method to the madness here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and in the quiz, it wasn't really good that you have to write comments, and I was saying- No, it wasn't. Yeah. So but if you, it's okay if you- It's okay. Comments. It's okay, but you won't get extra marks. You only get marks for fully functional code, which we know won't happen because people cheated, right? <laughs> yes, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm sure they will. I'll be happy if they will. But I notice people struggling there, and I'm like, but if you answered this right, then why are you struggling, <laughs> guys? <laughs> I'll see you. <laughs> so, I think that's why I'm struggling. Uh, yeah. I my, my Moodle issues. So. Oh, okay, good. Uh, then once this is uploaded, I think you'll see your scores and everything else. But you get your mails, right? So it's just Moodle. Oh yeah. Okay. So your grade book will be up updated hopefully by the weekend or something. <laughs>